So, a warm welcome to everybody here at the Unexpected Encounter number three. Um, who has been to an earlier Unexpected Encounter? One, two, three, oh, that's more. Who's, is it really the third? Who, who, oh, some of them went to them all, that's great. It's my second. Uh, the first one was in Amsterdam, second one was here at Foundation We Are, um, which uh, is a beautiful space. We said, like, they call the village because it's not only their headquarters, their office, but it's also a place where you can come, sit, work, meet other people, and host events like this. And then at certain times, it's also an exhibition space. So if you ever feel like doing something in Eindhoven, come here and ask them if you can collaborate with them. Um, thank you very much for coming to this interactive session. For the ones sitting in the back, maybe you can also come, come to the front because I'm going to run up and down uh, uh, <laughs> to you anyway. So, um, yeah, it's an interactive session, which means, yes, of course, there were three speakers invited with a brilliant expertise. And, of course, we will ask them a lot of questions. We will go into that, into a conversation with them about how do we actually imagine climate change? How do we visualize this? But it's also about you. It's also about us from different domains to actually get a grip on how can, how can we work on climate change and also how can we work together on climate change, right? Whose work is involved in climate change? Can I see your hands? Uh -huh. Aren't we all? I see somebody here. <laughs> well, to be honest, let's see if we are indeed all from different domains. Let's get up. And I'm going to ask you, what is your profession, your field of expertise? I'm going to ask you, what is your role in climate change? And or how it is connected indeed to climate change? If you feel like, ah, that's me actually, that person is talking exactly about what I do, then you can sit down. But if it's not, you keep standing, okay? So I'm going to run to somebody I don't know, or not really know. Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Alex. Uh, what, what do you do? What's your profession? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, well, I'm actually working at a uh, foundation we are. Um, I'm kind of coordinating part of the program that's uh, the, the internal program uh, with, the, um, with the collaborations for future project. And um, yeah, I, I think I'd probably call myself a design researcher. Design researcher? And what's your role in climate change? In what way is it connected to climate change? Oh, um, well, <laughs> uh, I, I'm probably contributing to it. Um, and um, yeah, hopefully making, uh, working towards diminishing my own impact, but also others. That would be a, a goal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Everybody's still standing, so no other design researchers here? Let me also give the example. My name is Marcia, Marcia Simon. I'm an independent moderator, presenter, and program maker in the creative industries. And I think my role in design is to burst our design bubble. Because I believe, indeed, we just need to collaborate with many, many, many others to actually make a difference, to actually make impact. So that's my role. I still see everybody standing. Oh, there's somebody sitting down. Somebody sitting. You, you, feel that, you feel connected to my role? Not not the moderator part, but I think uh, yeah, it's about bursting bubbles and to connect and then work together towards it. That was very uh, yeah, I thought. And and what is our challenge? What is our challenge? Um, the challenge is to kind of uh, make up for the time that we're losing because it's going too slow. The, the I think the solutions are there, but we need to be quicker. So hands uh, on deck. <laughs> I'd say everyone on board. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me let me continue my uh, my conversation here. Who are you? What's your profession? My name is Lieke. My profession is to be a documentary filmmaker. Um, I don't make any films about climate change, uh, but I'm just uh, curious. Like, I want to learn more about it. So that's why I came here. I think that's exactly why we are, uh, why, why we are hosting these, uh, these series, these unexpected uh, encounters. What kind of movies do you make? I think uh, I focus mainly on how people are... Um, how people live their lives, different way of lives, how people 
uh, invullen van hun leven, hoe zeg je dat? How they giving form to their lives. I'm very interested in that. Okay, I think in a way I already hear Gideon saying, yeah, that's also connected to what I make as a documentary maker. Oh. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for coming here. Are you from Eindhoven? Have you ever been here? Uh, yeah, I start to live here now for three months because my boyfriend lives here. <laughs> oh, and why is he not here? <laughs> he was uh, scared for you. <laughs> he's afraid of me. He al he's already met me before. Yeah, the interactive questions. <laughs> He said, I'm tired. I'm not sure if I go <laughs> I'm going to make it. <laughs> okay, so next time you have to bring him because we have to burst the bubbles. Okay, promised. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Um, let, me, um, let me go here. Haven't been here. So, who are you? I'm uh, Mariska. I'm a designer. I also uh, teach at Design Academy. So I think that's maybe a bit climate change related because we have a studio called Silva Systems where we take the forest as a starting point for the students to work on. And I also worked for Precious Plastic for a really long time, so recycling plastic. And I have a um, stichting now with that, but we, we need money. A waste welcome. But yeah, we are writing a lot of subsidies and we didn't get anything so far. So that's what blocks, that's our challenge to start actually doing and having an impact. It's like getting the funds to actually start having the machines and doing something. Thank you very much. And what kind of role do you play in, in climate change? Uh, As a on a personal scale? Yeah, I think education or like sharing the story so other people also understand how they can contribute. So both with the recycling plastic, but also with the students of like, uh, oh yeah, opening doors for others to, uh, to start doing their own thing, um, whatever their own thing is. And what is the challenge of your students at the moment regarding climate change? Um, I think a lot of students are wondering, as a designer, does it make sense to still produce things? Um, so the making part, we already have so many stuff around us, so what can they contribute? Um, and so it's a lot also about sourcing materials, where does it come from? Um, in like yeah the link of the designer the role in the ecosystem of like capitalism as a big ecosystem where do you place yourself <laughs> and yeah. and how do you deal with them i think they heard yeah okay thank you thank you very much i still see a lot of people standing which means um it's not all designers let, let, let me go here then who are you i'm philippe uh, i'm an architect so a designer in a way, but um, I'm involved actually in, let's say, the social, transi social transition. Right now I see that the transition towards a uh, circular future is a lot around materials. And I think that to create a sustainable future in which climate change is not existing anymore uh, would be one where the social trans transition has a big uh, impact. But I don't see anyone running for it within my field. Okay. And, and why did you come here? Well, um, knowing foundation we are, knowing that they do interesting stuff, um, yeah, curious about the talks, and really wonderful to see you again. <laughs> thank you very much. It it could be nice to come and see me. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Philip. Um, I still see some people standing. Um, why why am I asking all these questions? Because the unexpected encounters is all about collaborating. It's about collaborating with different people from different fields, right? And there's a focus within this design program, um, which is scientists. Are there also some scientists in the audience? I used to be a scientist. Okay, well, let me run over to you. What, who are you? What's your, what's your background? Uh, mathematics and physics. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what brings you here? Uh, just curiosity, but I also, I, for the past couple of years, I've been consulting with gov for governments also on uh, climate change issues, but more like on the mathematical side of it. And do you work together with, with designers or architects, or uh, how, how do you work? Never with an architect, but sure, with designers, yeah, like uh, usually multidisciplinary groups of people, yeah. And wh why is that important? In what way does that contribute to your work and your mission? Well, I don't know everything. <laughs> they don't know everything. I mean, you have to work together, no? Uh, it's, it's really not much more deep than that, I think. We just have to figure stuff out together. And does that all go, go by itself, or is it sometimes also challenging? Um, no, I mean, I, I think it goes very well, actually. Yeah, w I mean, um, uh, I know some people I can work with. They have different backgrounds. Actually, one is an architect, now that I think of it. But, uh, yeah, 
uh, yeah, we just work together very well. And we write reports and we try to help governments occasionally to figure stuff out, like with what to do with water and that kind of stuff. I was actually having a conversation with a scientist today in uh, at the University of Utrecht. And they actually said, well, it's actually quite hard for us to work together with all these different disciplines because we have such a different language. And um, also, the, the people are asking from us something that we are not that good at. For example, we have to write a story from our research that has to be understood by many people so that people can bring it into practice. And therefore, we really need to collaborate because it's something that we at least still not can do. So I'm very, uh, I'm very interested in then how, why do you work together with other people in such an easy way? What, what is your magic? I, I think what you're saying is exactly what you need to do at the start. You have to uh, develop a shared vocabulary. So you have to start to explain to each other what you think a word means. And then you'll find out that words often don't mean the same things to, to different people. So you just write them down and uh, you, know, you have discussions about it. It's uh, Yeah, I think a lot of scientists just don't think about this kind of stuff because they're too busy writing grants. And that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not really asking. And how can we find you later on? Uh, what do you mean, find me? What is your email address? What is your phone number? Where do you live? <laughs> All right, I'll write it down at some point, okay? <laughs> because he knows he has the magic. He has the magic. Okay, you, you can all sit down. Um, yeah, so welcome here at the Unexpected Encounter number three, which is about how do we see climate change, which is part of the um, collaborations for future. Uh, we've invited three speakers. Um, we will talk about their personal motivations, of course. We will talk about how did they actually come to a point where they really choose for climate change and how does that work? Uh, what does their day look like? What are they feeling they are responsible for? How they are really creating impact? And how do they envision the future? Um, we've gone to the heart of the matter and I would like to start with something a little bit different. Please close your eyes. Because the heart of the matter today is indeed how is climate change made visible to us? How do we, exp how do we picture or create a picture of something so complex? Let's create a first impression of us together, quickly. Think of climate change. What do you see? Come up with the three words to describe your image. Keep your eyes closed. And when I come to you, you share your three words. The rest keeps the eyes closed. Three words. Um, water, uh, ecosystems, I, I imagine something about flow, but I cannot really, uh, let's say flow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, warm, big, and slow. Warm, big, and slow. Blue, brown, yellow. Blue, brown, yellow. Uh, too much water, silence, and Nothing. Thank you. Chaos, rain, and drought. Thank you. A lot of products, a lot of clothing, emptiness. Thank you. Uh, water, uh, drowning, and empty city. Thank you. Water, silent, spring. Thank you. Waste, water, and societies. Waste, water, and society. Rising sea levels, animals getting extinct, and wildfires. Thank you. Um, breakdown of social structure, um, drought, and... Uh, <laughs> Misery. I, uh, I have a depression here. Can we get some help? Thank you. Ice, uh, fire, and water. Ice, fire, and water. Very elemental. Um, extinction, forest fires, and drafts. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, heat, storm en ignorance. Heat, storm en ignorance. Scarcity, um, panic en extinction. Thank you. Warm earth en universe. Warm earth, universe. Uh, war en biodiversity en famine. Famine? Famine, ja, yeah, like hunger. Ja, yeah, oké. Okay. Oh. Um, resilience. Time frame and <laughs> entropy. Oké. Okay. Last but not least. Fire, pain and community. Thank you very much. It's very nice that we ended this, this whole series with community. Please open your eyes. We were quite on the same level. I heard a lot of water. Uh, I got a little bit depressed with um, the gentleman over there <laughs> as well. Uh, there was one was a little bit out about products, clothing. Yeah, that was, I think, the only one who's really uh, addressing it, I think. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Um, I didn't share mine, did I? I think I it was on the same level. A lot of water, a lot of ice, and indeed the loss of diversity. That's what I also feel when I did this exercise with myself, when I prepared myself. It's almost time to get to our speakers. But before we do that, I want to look at a little clip from a documentary. Please, let us see the first clip. We are told that the ice caps are melting, but not all ice caps are melting. Actually, when we look at the Earth, you know, we got two poles. And yes, one of the poles is melting, but the other one isn't. So, it all levels out. We shouldn't worry so much. And even if changes come, you know, changes have always been coming to the climate. It has always been colder and warmer, and we are not stupid. We can handle that. Maybe it was a little bit too denigrating. Yeah, that wasn't good, no? Oh, I love that. I love that. That, yeah. that, that is actually critical. We have, we have people promoting policies that... Yeah, Gideon, what, what is this, this little clip about? So this is like a kind of workshop that I got in the Heritage Foundation in America, like uh, 2000, I don't know, 16 or something. So they're really, um, they, uh, they're, they get paid, they're a think tank and they get paid by the fossil fuel industry to come up with all kinds of, uh, to make reports that climate change isn't really real, that make, uh, in order to make people doubt the reality of climate change. So they lobby a lot against uh, uh, everything that uh, is for the climate. Yeah. And so everybody who wants change uh, is like their enemy. So I went there to get a workshop. So how do they sell their shit? <laughs> so there you saw me uh, talking like a climate change denier. And the guy who was standing next to me, he's one of the, yeah, the he's a big lobbyist over there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. L let's do one little measurement here of our, of our audience. No Mentimeter, just a people uh, a meter. Um, who feels like they are a climate change denier? Please stand up. None of you, not, not even in doubt, no, none, none of the time, not a single moment you doubt it. Okay, I see, I see somebody here. Yeah, yeah, you go, go, get up, get up, yeah. I'm standing next to you, I'm also standing, so wh why do you sometimes are in doubt? Well, I, d I guess kind of in my daily life, I kind of, I push it back because I, yeah, it's it's so big that I, I don't really know. So it, it kind of, it stays in the background and I feel like part of me is, is trying to deny it so that I don't, it's not constantly there. Um, so yeah, I, I do think there's a part of me that does deny it. Can I get a big round of applause for this answer? <laughs> uh, Gideon, we, we, we were wondering maybe you needed to explain it, but this explains it all, right? Yes, yes, I, I, I completely agree with her. I think everybody is a climate, in some ways, on some level, a climate denier. I am too, so I join your group. And uh, I think it's a constant fight for...
for every human being to face reality and to face reality uh, during climate change is difficult and painful. So that's why, you know, denying is uh, one of our uh, specialties as human beings, I think. And it, it also has a very big upside. You don't feel pain. You can just continue your life. It has a downside as well if you are in denial of reality, but reality doesn't mind. So it, the change goes on, and the less we do, the, the world or uh, physics doesn't care for our uh, stupidity. So the, the effects will just be worse if we do nothing and stay in denial. So the next time you think climate change denier, that's not me, maybe. You are. Uh, when we were talking about it, indeed, I also had to admit I am during the day. I took a little bit too long of a shower. I was driving a little bit too hard. I was driving. I had children. I thought, ah, oh, it's not never going to be right. Can I get a big warm applause for our first speaker, Gideon Levy, <laughs> who is a documentary filmmaker. Please sit down wherever you feel like. Um, of course, known from, for example, Klimaatontkenners from 2016, who saw this documentary. Klimaatontkenners, yes, there. Uh, we just saw a little clip of it. Vaarwel America, who has seen this one from 2020. Okay, still a lot of homework to do. And then, of course, Trump and the Joden from 2022. All great work to, that you can still see at uh, Tudoc, right? Um, but you're also a founder of an NGO. Why? Why? Why did you start an NGO? And what? What is this NGO all about? So. Uh Yep. You hear me? Yeah. So I um, I made a film uh, called Goodbye America. It's a film about uh, climate scientists who work in the United States for the United States government. And I started to film them uh, when Trump got elected because I was wondering uh, what would it mean if you're a climate scientist and you work for the United States government and your boss becomes uh, in your is a climate denier. So what does will that mean for your job? So I found a few people, and one of those uh, uh, scientists was a woman called Emily Wilson, and she was a developer of an instrument that measures greenhouse gases, and it was a revolutionary uh, uh, instrument. And it took her about 10 years to develop this instrument with a very big team, in a very and she had a very big lab, and she had a very important position. And this is when I... Uh, I met her in the last stage of the development. Um, and I think shit hit the fan w within that year that within NASA they were they were starting to make cuts. And where did they start? Of course, uh, did the department where they measure uh, uh, the atmosphere. And so her program was cut eventually and um, she got another job at NASA and all the instruments went into some kind of cupboard and uh, for the film it was uh, really a drama and um, uh, so I kept on following her in the film you also see that she comes to Holland and there are and I introduce her and the her instruments to people of the KNMI and they all said well that's a fantastic instrument we we would love to have that instrument and um, uh, but the instrument wasn't ready, so it stayed in the cupboard, and I finished the film. And uh, and all all the time in the back of my mind, I mean, there were a lot of scientists that I followed in this film, and who all had tragic stories, but her story st stuck with me, and especially this instrument, this machine that we really needed. So, uh, and I wrote up uh, something about it, so how can I start up a uh, NGO, a stichting, to help her. But I, I thought, well, I'm a filmmaker, I should just let it go. But then, a few years later, Corona struck. I was uh, watching the ceiling. Had uh, nothing to do. Like all of you. <laughs> but so be frustrated. Yes, yeah, so then I, then I said, okay, Gideon, this is a sign you've got to work. This is some, Everybody is home, so you can reach everybody. So I started to make calls and uh, try to help Emily to revive the instrument. And uh, this is this why that so that's the NGO that I started, the Greenhouse Gas Monitor, and uh, our first aim is to get that uh, machine up and running. And how far along are you then? We're almost there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I I now know a little bit about more about science <laughs> and about how difficult it is to uh, really achieve something new. But we're almost there, and uh, it, it 
looks really promising. So I'm I'm very ex excited. Yeah. Okay, I'm very curious. We, maybe we'll get back to it later. Yeah. Um, it's time for me to introduce uh, Veerle van Herk. Please welcome her to the stage with a warm welcome. <laughs> Image editor of The Correspondent. Um, studied illustration herself at the Willem de Koning Academy in Rotterdam, but also arts and society at the University of Utrecht. And um, yeah, you are really connecting visual artists to journalists, aren't you? I am, yes. yes. And, and how do you balance it with your own work? Are you still also illustrating yourself? Um, yeah, partly. Yeah, one, one day a week. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think I, I use that way of thinking really in my work as, a, as an image editor. And I think it's really nice because some stories are just better to tell through photography or film. And it's really nice that I can still think in these media but don't need the skills to... Uh, to create it, I can work with whoever. Uh, and, and and when did you graduate? 2019, somewhere there. Um, I think uh, uh, the Willem de Koning like illustration was in 2020. 20. During the first lockdown, and then two years later the masters. Yeah. Okay. And you thought, well, I love the correspondent. I love their pick of choice for for illustrations and and and, and graphics. Um, instead of putting my own work there, I'm going to work for them. Wha yeah. wh why did you do that? Why did you choose that? Um, yeah, maybe because I, I don't see myself as a typical illustrator. I don't want to be only uh, behind my desk, but I really like to collaborate and to be part of the story from the beginning and really um, work together with uh, journalists. Um, so, yeah, I think also during my studies, I've always searched for places where I can combine both the image making and the more in-depth research and just engaging with all sorts of societal topics. So yeah, I think uh, Girls from the End will be uh, was the perfect place for that. Yeah. yeah li a little bit fast forward, just, just a short answer. We were mm -hmm. talking about this collaboration between different people or different backgrounds. Uh, does uh, the collaboration between the artists and the journalists always go perfectly well? No, it's sometimes really hard to convince uh, journalists why art should also be seen as a form of journalism. Um, but I think comparing to other newspapers or media, um, we have a bit of a different approach. And uh, I know the journalists are also um, familiar with, with our way of, of uh, using images with stories. And um, I think also, especially for the kind of journalism that we have, because we're not really focusing on the news of today. I don't know if you all know the Cosmen, but um, the idea is that we are not focusing on the news of today, but more look at the, all the developments that are behind the news and uh, in order to get a better understanding of the world and all the things that are going on every day instead of only focusing on the exceptional or like what we see on the front page of, of the newspapers. Yep. Um, and I think... Um, using or combining this with art um, uh, also gives uh, it's also something like the artists also uh, um, uh, have researched this topic and they put a lot of time in it and it's a different approach than just showing what is written in the text it's just thinking about okay how how shall we visualize this story and what perspectives do we choose um, so I think, yeah, it works very well for the yeah. kind of stories. And yeah. the end, yes. D did you experience that maybe a visual artist really changed the perspective of the journalist? Um, yeah. Uh, or maybe broadened the perspective? Yes. Yeah, it, it's hard to come up with an example, but I think... Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I can show some examples later uh, this evening. Then I can maybe I can. I'll give you to time. This. Yeah, yes. we'll, yeah, we'll get we'll get back to it. Yeah. Talking about changing perspective, um, who dares to interrupt me every now and then? Who has a great feeling for dynamics, and who has an interest in changing perspective? Everybody's like, mm. if if you don't, if nobody comes to me, I come to you. I thought you were very quirky, so I'm going to pick you. So this is a card, somewhere between 2003, as you see, and 2033. 
you can um, give us a time out to change perspective, to broaden our perspective. So I give it to you. You choose your moment to interrupt. I think you are bold enough, aren't you? <laughs> it's time for, um, for our last speaker to introduce um, uh, Christian Kaus all the way from, is it Brussels? Oh, Antwerp. Came for Antwerp. Documentary photographer with a specialty in oceans and the polar regions. Uh, I just said to him, it's quite cold. And he was like, it's not cold here. <laughs> Which is really funny. Um, you have a different public, I think. Of course, we all have, I think, some doubleness in, in, our, in the public that we reach. But you also reach out to the governments, right? To a more professional, scientific field. Is that correct? Hello. Good evening, everyone. Yes, it works. Uh, that's correct, actually. Um, to be more precise, I reach out to a lot of audiences, okay. different audiences. So what I do is I bridge with image. So my background is political science. I started in the Flemish parliament. Yep. Belgium is a federation, so for the Flemish, um, I worked in the Flemish parliament as a communication advisor. And then in 2014, after eight months of networking, I managed to enter the global seed vault in Svalbard. And this is a quite an inaccessible place. And this is where I um, well, got even more aware of this conflict between man and nature. And that's really the starting point in every photo that I take, every project that I take. And since then, I became professional as well. So I had the mission, it's a life's mission, to raise awareness on um, topics like biodiversity decline, um, not only fauna, but also flora, also our food patterns and everything. Uh, but also rising sea levels, the consequences of, uh, of the impact of global warming and uh, climate change in general. And so what I do is the, the mission statement, as uh, you know, like formally, is really to bridge through image um, the industry, uh, governments, so dip diplomacy spheres, and also the uh, scientific uh, institutes. So I collaborate with all those three. So okay. I work for governments, or with, not for, sorry, <laughs> big difference. Yes. I'm completely independent and apolitical. Okay. So of course I have an opinion, but it doesn't matter. You can ask me my opinion, I will give it to you, but that's not what I do. So okay. I, what I do is really on the front line of climate change in a very neutral way, as far as this is possible with image. So I consider myself to be a documentary photographer. I go there and document what is at stake and document the impact that is already happening. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, of course, we have those photos. We're not, we're not going to spoil it yet. Um, we will do, uh, do that a little bit later. But what if uh, you and me are sitting on a birthday and my uh, Tante Rietje is sitting here and uh, you need to explain your, your job to uh, my Tante Rietje, who's really not into all of this. How would you explain in, in baby language to my Tante Rietje what you do? That's a good, nice question, I like it. Well, I would say that um, I'm a photographer and I make stories to make people understand that we are part of nature. Okay, and then she asks, then what kind of photos do you make? Then I would say, well, I go on ships to islands, but I also go on ships to uh, the cold regions, polar regions, and then I will explain, you know, North Pole, South Pole, and I will document the purest places on this planet. and. By saying that, I will probably raise more questions, which I like. <laughs> so I will, I will try to explain that there is still some purity left. Yes. And that I will try to explain, maybe without words, that humans leave an impact. And the impact is really becoming big. So, yeah. So always bring Christian to your birthdays, this means. A big round of applause also for our three speakers here. <laughs> Can you? Take us back to the moment that you thought, okay, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a, I can make some photos, I, I can make beautiful illustrations, and I'm going to pick climate change as my topic. Can you please take us back to the moment that you started to think, yes, I'm going to put my working life to this topic, which is so complex. Gideon, you already have the, have the answer? Um. Well, the the thing is that um, uh, uh, I would love to make films only about climate change because it's such a broad uh, subject. Uh, but I'm not. I'm, I'm making films about m many different different things. And um, 
but but most most of the time when I start to make projects, I'm afraid to say that it. Oh, Mo yeah, like 90% <laughs> it starts out of frustration, anger, <laughs> uh, embarrassment, uh, um, things like that. That th things that if something really gets to me, then I then I've got some fuel to make a project uh, about. Because most of my projects take uh, a longer time, so you need really, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you need some kind of fuel that makes you want to finish it and really tell the story. So uh, and 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 climate change denial really triggered me because uh, uh, I was really wondering how can you uh, what happens to someone when he starts doing yeah uh, to to really get into the industry of trying to convey to people like bullshit that hurts not only all of us but also himself or herself. Yeah, and then you thought, well, I really have to go. I want to know the, those people. I want to look them in the eye. Yeah. I want to know how they do it and how they do it. And 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 most most of the time, when you are, uh, I find it's a kind of trick that I have used often. When you talk to people that you really despise, yeah. it also works very much if you just hug them. Okay. and says, I want to be like you, and how do you do it? And explain me what you do, because people love to explain what they do. I mean, I like to tell about making movies, maybe you like to tell about your job, so th that's just human nature. So, and, and it worked, it b because if I would have, I, I've also come up to climate deniers trying to convince them that they were wrong, but that is a, a boring for the audience to see. It's much more fun and, uh, and and you learn much more if you just say, well, you're fantastic, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and try to be honest in your interest and then you, you, you'll be surprised what you learn. But but I also saw in, in, in your documentaries that people were really also doubting you as you were sitting at the table and they were really clear about, yeah, but you, you are from the Netherlands and you, that, that lady, for example, in, uh, yeah. in, that, in that restaurant, yeah. um, uh, they despise you as well, don't they? How, how do you break through uh, that trust? Uh, uh, um. you, I mean, you, you, you do have their trust. Yeah. Because they give, the, they give their story to you. Yes. But I see them doubting yeah. what to say and what not to say. How do you level that? How do you handle that? Uh, I'm just, uh, I try to hold back my opinion a little bit and just ask questions and try to learn how they think because it, it, I'm not there to convince them. I, I'm making a movie and I, I want to tap into their minds in order to show other people what, what is the general thought amongst certain people. So th then it doesn't work to say, well, you're wrong. I just try to invite them uh, and to tell me their story, their opinion, and, and why do they think the way they think. Are you also contributing already to climate change in that moment when you are filming and when you, when you are interviewing? It, are you already contributing in your role as a filmmaker in that heat of the moment? Well, I'm sure contributing to pollution because I fly <laughs> over to America. Yeah. Uh, but uh, well, uh, one of the things that one of the reasons why I started out being a um, filmmaker was that I had uh, the ambition to, uh, yeah, to have a little influence to, to hope to better the world in some ways by telling stories and by filming them. Yeah. And and when the the work is done, and when the result is there, the movie is there. It's produced. It's being shown. It's being viewed. Uh -huh. um, how do people respond? Is it is it very broad, or uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? In general, oh, um, in, in general, uh, when you make a film and people get angry, you did something r right, <laughs> probably. Uh, Did people sometimes really get angry? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, many. Could you give an example? Uh, well, the craziest thing that I've ever uh, uh, encountered is that I'm, uh, but it has nothing to do with climate change. But I made a film about uh, a uh, uh, a terrorist attack on an airplane, 
and in the film something crazy happens because the people who had uh, um, were did fraudulent things with the evidence uh, just admitted it on camera and and that was so crazy that after uh, like half a year another film came out where those people uh, like retracted their words <laughs> so so uh, yeah which was really crazy and they were that one was the head of the FBI and one of was the head of the uh, uh, Scottish uh, secret police so Th those two people, they they managed to make let another documentary maker make another film to prove that they were right or some. Th that was really crazy. Th yeah, I mean, I I I I've encountered many people who have become angry about my films to say, "Oh, that's bullshit," and you're crazy, man. But, th but that's that's okay. That happens a lot. But that somebody makes another film, <laughs> that is something. <laughs> then, yeah. then, then uh, what does that do to you? Oh, that made me really proud. Proud, yeah? <laughs> yeah, to be honest, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, wh why why, why, why does, I can also imagine because that you... Because how did they do that? To make an old documentary, an old international big documentary, to, yeah, yeah it indeed. was uh, ridiculous. Yeah, like, the, 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 there is also, you know, you're very naive when you think, oh, I, you know, I'm tw I'm for 25 years now, I'm a filmmaker, so you start off and you think, oh, I'm going to change the word with a film, you know. That doesn't happen. But the funny thing is that those people who were in this film, they also thought the same thing. That if we make a film that counters that film, then the world changes. It doesn't. So you also have the humor to, to <laughs> counter that. Yeah. I, I see you nodding. Do you also encounter this, these kinds of situations with your photographies? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I have a lot of reactions uh, worldwide. Um, mostly... Well, it's always the same argument of the climate deniers. They would say, well, it's a cyclic event, which is true. But it's not true in the end, because it's the pace that is different. It's a decline, and the pace of the decline of biodiversity that is really alarming. It's the level of CO2 in a very short time uh, amount of time that is in the atmosphere now. So it's obvious that it's an anthropogenic contribution that was never seen before, and some, you know, IPCC scientists are talking about the sixth ma mass extinction, and uh, I believe we are facing that. But that's my opinion again. So it's I see it as my role to document as much as I can, to maybe convince people. It's not really about convincing, but I don't like manipulating, like manipulating, like uh, you know, I don't like to be an activist. I believe activism is very useful, and I have a lot of respect for actually all kinds of activism to the extent that they don't, you know, get in violent or something, you know. So normal kind of activism, but I see my role as a as a. Witness. What is normal activism? Yeah, well <laughs> you know what I mean. It's just like. No, I don't. No, just no, no. Uh, don't you know? Don't get too far like uh, in intruding. That's the word, right? Like getting violent or intruding into a person's sphere or like some activists are really getting too. Uh, uh, I don't know, violent, like verbally or maybe more. I, is this your, your, your honest feeling uh, or is, is it also a strategy? Yeah. No, it's an opinion. <laughs> it's an opinion. <laughs> I don't know why I talk about my opinion. No, I see myself as a witness. I, I don't have I'm an opinion, I, mean I talk about my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I do have an opinion. Okay. Of course I do. Yeah, yeah, I think it's course. important that people yes. have an opinion. Okay, but great. in my mission, I'm, I'm here also to tell about the mission, the importance of image to document, yeah. as you believe as well. I think uh, that image is a really useful tool, a universal language that everyone speaks. I learned out of the Flemish parliament that you know, these policy reports, strategy reports, with my background uh, studies, okay, it's a, s a specific way of thinking. Um, and, and and the outcome is always different than the data of a scientist, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a complete, complete different language. They think different, they act different. So I see it as my role to really be amongst all those people yep. and document scientific work, but also climate change and bring it to the diplomacy level, showing what is at stake, showing what these scientists are doing and why and the instruments and methods and just explaining. I'm going to ask the both of you because you both gave an example of how something could also work. But I would like, because of course, you, all, you were talking about climate depression, actually, right? In the, in the beginning, when everybody was cl with closed eyes. Um, but please, take a moment and come up with an example co as concrete as possible. You have to think, this is why I, I make my work. 
this is why I go there and, and go into actually, I think, dangerous places as well. And, 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 and yeah, of course, have this kind of passion and it doesn't always result in what you want. But please come up with a concrete example that you think this is why I do what I do. And then let me first get to Veerle. So you've been sitting there and listening. Um, at the correspondent, they really have a clear, clear mission. D and, and are you really getting along with that mission or do you have your personal mission within your work? Mm, yeah, I feel myself part of this mission. Um, what is that mission? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, well, I think especially when talking about climate change, um, this mission really works well because um, I think we should s uh, approach climate change not as only looking at the extremes or like the extreme weather or like when something is happening, but more see it as part of also our social economical problems or issues and uh, something that is happening every day and, and that we in all sorts of uh, sides of society, we have to, to see climate change as part of that and, and not, not only when something happened somewhere. So yeah, if, if that answers your question. Um, yeah. And, and your personal mission as an, an image editor at the Correspondence, what, what is your role there? Um, well, uh, I'm responsible for, or I decide what the images uh, we, we pick for the, for the articles. Um, so I get the, the articles from the authors from the when there are still drafts. Um, and then I, I, I get to think about uh, how, how we will visualize this, these stories. Um, and most times we also discuss with the authors um, to ask like what is really want what you want to reach, um, what is really what you want to stick to the reader and, and how can we um, with the images help to, to reach that goal. Um, but also uh, I think it's interesting to see how through images we can add uh, new perspectives on certain topics. Um, and that's I think when it when it's really interesting um, to uh, work with existing projects from artists with their articles um, and also to have the luxury of, uh, of using the expertise of these image makers um, because when it comes uh, well yeah, actually with all topics but also with climate change we really start searching for people that are already working with these topics and really can uh, contribute uh, to these topics with their own research or what, what they already know. Um, and uh, yeah. I, I have so many questions for you, but maybe you can already answer many of those questions if you take us along on your day. Mm -hmm. y you get up and then, then wh what do you do? How, how do you start um, your day? Well, uh, we, uh, we start with coffee every day. Uh, and then uh, we have this planning. <laughs> Uh, of all the articles um, and I'm with a group of uh, two image editors and two information designers and one lead um, and uh, yeah we just uh, decide who's going to work for what article. Um, I think we have most times about one or two weeks uh, before the publication uh, date is there uh, to come up with an idea for, for the articles um, and yeah, we just start reading the articles. Um, sometimes we brainstorm with each other about uh, what we want to visualize, um, or we ask uh, ask the, authors the author when we, yeah. when we don't understand certain topics that well, um, or we do some research ourselves into the topics, and um, and then it's actually just uh, googling and <laughs> uh, for nice projects or exhibitions on these topics or it also really depends on the 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 kind of articles sometimes the articles are really explainers so you also want images that that help to get that point and and to uh, make it more clear so it's would not work to give a whole new perspective from an artist on that topic because it just won't make sense um, but sometimes um, articles are more um, meanderend, um, how would you say, like uh, philosophical or poetic. Yep. Yep. Um, and then I think those articles are really um, uh, good for, for other projects and making connections. But, but may I ask, I mean, you, you're quite 
uh, young, just coming from, from the academy, and, you, you know, and then you had your masters, um, and then you read these articles, which are, it's quite complex, meta, right? And then you have to just come up with an idea of how can we visualize that. Mm -hmm. How did you start to do that after your, your studies? Um, well, asking a lot uh, to the authors as well. Uh, could could you also just, just call them and, 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 and... We're working together. I mean, we're okay. the same floor. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we're just working together. Um, but, yeah, and but I think all the... I think the authors are already doing a good job in the way they translate the knowledge from scientists or policy makers into uh, stories that are readable and understandable. Um, and sometimes we try to make them even more accessible through the images. Yeah. Um, you, you brought a, a couple examples. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can take one, one of the examples in which, where you can really show us how you work and how you really contribute together with the author and the visual artist and how you really came with, with actually an extra layer mm -hmm. within, within the article. Which one would you like to show us? Um, to think what I, what I brought. Uh, maybe, well, this is this is not so interesting <laughs> to talk. Um, maybe this one, um, because as a preparation for this evening, I dived into our archive yeah. to see what images we are publishing with articles uh, related to climate change. And it was actually really nice to see a kind of pattern um, and also our role as image editors, because uh, looking at uh, articles from around 2015 or more the beginning of climate journalism, um, um, we, you see, I mean, I, I was not there, so it was not my decision, but you see that um, the, the, the way we write about climate change is really as explaining people what it is and, and how it affects us, but also in the images, um, you really see a distance and we, we look at it from a distant view to nature. And later, I think the tone of voice of the, Im uh, of the articles change and they uh, are more urgent or warning. And I think these articles, it's also, you see also that we as image editors um, know better what, that we can take different as, uh, perspectives towards these uh, questions. So I think these two um, uh, articles uh, really show that. Um, for example, the uh, the one on the right, um, we decided to pub. Uh, uh, sure, I, I should have my glasses on because I cannot read it. <laughs> so um, what do you want me to read? <laughs> Wait. Um, Was a klein dan doet maakt toch niet uit, or? First, no, it's really small. Also with uh, with glasses. Met but wereldwide maybe the protest actions. Maybe I just talk about the images. Okay. Um, no, but we we decided uh, to not show climate change uh, like directly, but uh, for or um, picked a series from the photographer Reiner Reed, Reiner Riedler, um, who uh, made the series Fake Holidays, um, and uh, he photographed all kinds of. Um, uh, resorts or like holiday resorts where they created fake nature and it's a bit like the Truman Show so you sometimes in some images you really see the globe um, and it's quite um, absurd um, but we try to to we use these images um, to make people think about how we respond to climate change and um, yeah adding a second layer by looking at, at our human behavior and um, I think these images you can read as how we are ignoring um, or maybe how we as humans try to shape nature um, but also really want to stick to this image of nature so we created ourselves if it's not possible to go there and we republished this series uh, more recently um, uh, when when it was the news that uh, the the winter sport resorts, the the ice was melting, so it was not possible an, anymore to to go skiing, and then we uh, published this series again, just like more ironical, like this is the future of our holidays, um, if we are not um, able to go to uh, to France or Italy to ski, then maybe we should create these landscapes ourselves, but more ironical, like try to make people think about how we respond to climate change and how we still yeah. keep 
ignoring hey, it. This is 2019. Yes. You really yeah, looked into your archive yes. and, and figured, hey, it really changed. W yeah. What changed? Um, well, I think in the beginning, um, it was really hard to, that's also what I discussed with, the, with some image editors that already worked then, but um, that it was really hard to find projects from artists or photographers that were uh, really focusing on this on this topic and uh, brought their own expertise into this topic. So maybe, I don't know if y you can switch to the really first articles. Um, I think it's number one, <laughs> it's in the file name. Yeah, this one. So these are uh, some articles from, uh, from the g beginning. Um, Is this connecting to the images that we were imagining when we closed our eyes? Yeah, I was also thinking Ice, about that. water. Yeah. But in a way, I think... We're running behind with our images in our heads. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because it's so far away from us and um, we're not um, interacting with it or especially the, the blue marble or the, the earth, like the, which is also connected to the overview effect, uh, the idea that... Um, astronauts have when they see the earth from space that they ha they get this feeling that they have to protect the earth um, but it's interesting that we really started with the articles that really zoom out and really show um, nature and but but didn't we didn't look at our role as humans in this problem so it was still very f distant yeah yeah and then is this something you you recognize as a photographer? Yeah, I do. I haven't been in space, but uh, I'm aware <laughs> of the effect. Yeah. And uh, it's a blue planet, huh? it's all water. <laughs> yeah, so that's I true. To it. <laughs> and you, you also recognize this? Of course, yeah. Yeah, in, in, the, in one of the uh, films that I made ab about climate change, yeah. I also use this image of looking from space to Earth. It's very powerful. Yeah. yeah. And now in 2024, what changed? I'm wondering if this still is powerful. Yeah. Sometimes, um, well, apparently, we still uh, we, we we were all mentioning kind of this this image, right? Yeah, Many of us were mentioning water and ice and but quite is distant it pictures. Is it because they are powerful, or is it because we are used to these images because we see them so often? Um, that's what I am wondering. What what do we think here? <laughs> is, isn't that related to generation? Because I think that we are, well, on average, uh, somewhat uh, between 20 and 40. Um, and I think that children age 5 to 10 right now, uh, for them, uh, Earth as a mar marble isn't the uh, great image, but uh, plastic waste piles, that's their uh, youth image. So I think for us, it's precious to, 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 to keep. And I think there's a generation coming that is far more... Um, yeah, how to say that negative about it because the, their images are way different. I'm curious. I was in the car with my five-year-old listening to podca children podcasts on the way here, and indeed it was a lot of. Yeah, it was a different image, I think. But you say 2040, we are 2040. Somebody's older. Here. <laughs> Is there a truth in there? D did the image change? I can imagine that it's different for kids that they have another image of what they think that's horrible, like with maybe animals that are hurt or so. That they it was exactly what the podcast was about, yeah. Okay, so that's what I would... And for you? Um, I was thinking of water, but I was also thinking about the water nearby us. So I was not just thinking about the big ice caps. Of course, I know about that, but I think also about more nearby, how we see all the, the levels rising uh, of uh, the little rivers around. And I know that maybe it's different in summer again, but still, you know that there are things going on that are not so really uh, like I was used to. You also brought a, an image much later in time, which I think expresses much more... Yeah, a much more realistic image. Maybe you can uh, take uh, us to the article which one are with you the uh, street lights and the people playing around ah, it. Ah, yeah. Uh, about um, money, but not about money in images. Yeah. This one. This one, yeah. I cannot, re oh, I forgot the name, it's too bad, but maybe you can scroll, scroll down. Scroll down? Yeah. It's uh, Sal Ruben Salgado, yeah. Um, it's from the series uh, Solar Portraits. And this is also an article that was quite recently published by Elmer Mommers 
on the COP in Dubai. Um, and it was all about, um, it was a really big explainer um, telling us how that like all the investments um, that we now have in, in green energy, as I, if I'm correct, um, don't um, measure out or like it's not that um, if we are now investing more in green energy that uh, there are less uh, fossil fuels used. I think it was about that. Yeah, the, la um, the, la the last um, unexpected encounter we had here, somebody from Follow the Money, and it was all about money streams, right? Yeah, and, and if you yeah. read this article, indeed, it's all about where does the money go, how mm -hmm. do we invest, and then connect it to climate change. Yeah, and but then you come up with these images. Yeah, so he, he calls this uh, sad facts in this article, um, because it's just a list of sad facts and that we need so much money if we want to... Yeah, <laughs> like uh, for three. Um, but um, we uh, chose a series or, um, from um, people all over the world um, that are connected to electricity and, uh, and um, light through solar energy for the first time in their lives. Um, and these um, uh, portraits go together with their personal stories and how it changed their lives. And um, yeah, I, we, we, I chose this because I, after reading this article, it was uh, really, um, well, not depressing, but really complex and really heavy. Um, and I think um, I wanted to go back to the essence of where it actually is about. And that's, um, yeah, how we... Um, can but then how, how, how does Yelmer respond to that? I mean, he's all about... He he yeah. knows all everything about economics. Yeah, he and was part he's of about this. numbers and, and data. Yeah. And um, was he immediately enthusiastic about showing yeah, these pictures? Yeah, because I was really struggling with this article because it was super complex. Yeah. So I um, I messaged him and and we went uh, through a, a few projects because yeah, there are always many options to to show with the articles. Um, but I think these images stick the most to us because they are really emotional and sensitive and, and fragile in a way. And yeah, but um, not in, a, in that a dramatic way. I mean, in a way, it's also hopeful. That, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's at least that's what I also feel. I don't know. Maybe we can go to the public. How, how, do, you, how do you get this picture? When you see a, a headline, can we see the, the headline about the, <coughs> what is it, four billion? Uh, the, yeah, the, the vraag van 4 biljoen, the question of 4 billion, hoe geld de toekomst van klimaat bepaalt. And then you see this image. Children on street light playing. What does that do to you, for example, here, when you see this? Um, for me, personally, uh, it would be hard to make the direct connection, but it would also make me curious about, uh, about the article. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, that's that's the first thing I would uh, I would think about. Yeah, but th that's actually what I like about it, um, because if I would see one of the melting ice caps, I would maybe even skip the article. Uh, so this makes it uh, yeah, uh, this is a different approach that I actually like. Yeah. Yeah. So it so it's it, it sparks, it creates interest. Somebody else different experience here. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I really like the approach that you took. Because it really, I think it does speak a lot also to the, it's also a bit dystopian because y the article says something like four trillion or billion for for climate change and to, to and for relief. And then, yeah, y once you see that, you assume maybe all that money goes to the rich countries and yeah, we throw in some solar panels for the poor people and they and all, all they get is a, is a street light <coughs> and, th and that's it. But it's at the same time, it's also kind of hopeful so it speaks to both uh, both sides what was the effect of this choice because people can respond on your platform right mm -hmm. you have very yeah. active conversations uh, about it I don't it's being shared I don't remember if sometimes people respond to the um, images underneath the articles but it's it's also sometimes guessing like how how, how do people get the the, the uh, images but yeah, we try to help uh, the reader a bit by also putting uh, a little text about uh, the decisions we made for, like the 
the projects and the articles or uh, the photographers underneath the article to also um, give a bit more context on. I mean, the correspondent is very known for making, you know, using these kinds of images, really working together with visual artists. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate if it works, what you do, if you make the right choices? How do you do that? Um, well, <laughs> we discuss it within our team and, and, and uh, with the people uh, um, that work at the Girls Men, but, but um, yeah, I think there, there should be more space for that. Yeah, yeah and okay. I, I really al also always hope that people respond to the images because I think also for many readers, they just skip the images. So it's a bit sad, but... Um, for me, it's a reason to go to Cosmo, okay, to be to honest. Yeah because of th the way you do it. Yeah. So maybe we can we can talk further on that. You want <laughs> to, to add something? Yeah, part of the uh, power of image is that it evokes emotion. It evokes so I emotion. think it was a difficult question to answer because mm -hmm. at a certain point, the ratio stops, you just feel it. It's a very powerful image. And especially I together, I like your reaction a lot uh, with the, the title. It's really evoking curiosity and you know also giving hope, so yeah. yeah. So good choice. <laughs> yeah. But, but at a certain point, it's with it's, it's with all forms of art. I think don't rationalize too much. Just feel it. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Is this for you a, a positive example of of your work? Is this something you, you're proud of? Yeah. 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 For sure. Great. Let's go to the gentleman. Have you have you did you come up with an example that you think yes, this is why I do what I do. Shall I start? <laughs> That's you have a many examples. Question, actually, well, uh, yeah. Uh, what is the specific question? Because well, I, I asked you to come up with an example, a concrete example of a photo or an image that you created that you gotta respond, an effect that you think yes, this is why I do what I do. I this is why I make I these photos. I generalize it, not one respond, but the youth. I don't okay. have children. I yep. want to have children, but I don't have. I, it's difficult to combine it with what I do. I will I always be away from home and I don't want that for my child huh? if I would have a child. So I think when I inspire children, that gives me really an emotional uh, well uh, drive. <laughs> the drive is there anyway, but that really touches me. So Well, this also touches me. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. And, and, and have you experienced this? Yeah, many times. Yeah. Can, Even you, give, children, can like, you take us along on that well, journey? I'm very like curious. A couple of, like three days ago, I had a, a, a mom and, and uh, uh, calling me saying, well, uh, our child, a uh, uh, child, yeah, singular, one child, um, loves your book really a lot. Maybe you should make a children's book. And I'm like, yeah, I have this idea for a long time already. Like explaining, you mentioned the podcast. I'm, I'm wondering about the communication and how to communicate to a five-year-old. I'm, I don't have the experience, but I would love to do that in the future. Yeah. So, talking about unexpected, I didn't expect this answer <laughs> from from the work oh, I've, okay. I've seen. <laughs> I've been scanning through your through your <coughs> imagery. Let, let's let's show it. Actually, some people maybe didn't know, didn't see it yet. Maybe just show some of these photos. I'm curious. <laughs> this one, for example, That's what are we looking began, at here? Uh, That's a good one to start. So everything started here for me, eight months before I took this photo. I saw what is the entrance of the global seed vault. So in Dutch, it's a Wereldzalen bank yeah, on Spitsbergen, on Svalbard. So the, the Norwegian government built the f this facility in two years, uh, finished in 2008, with the sole purpose to store all the copies of g genetic banks worldwide of food crops. So the diversity of our food crops for future generations. That's the sole purpose of this, to preserve it and to to keep the genetic data because once animals or plants are getting extinct, extinction means forever. Well, in this uh, era, uh, I know in China, well, in certain countries they're trying to resurrect uh, animals that <laughs> were extinct, but uh, we're not talking about that. So it's really about the biodiversity, the, the, the pace of the decline. It's where I saw this conflict and, and the urge to really get out there and show the photos and show what is at stake and the urgency. So I've been granted access after eight months. There are only three per, uh, persons on this planet with a key and it's really inaccessible. So for some reason, it's an emotional story. Can I tell it? Because last Definitely. year, last year I went to Sweden to one of the three key holders and I now have a big co coffee table book with the president of Kiribati writing a foreword and Peter Thompson of the UN Special Envoy for the, for the Ocean. 
So it, it's really, it's, it's something, you know. And I showed them that and I said, you look, to, uh, 2014, uh, this, uh, I showed them this photo, um, I showed them the book and I said, you opened the door, like symbolically, like uh, literally and figuurlijk. Yeah? So you really opened the door. It, it's where it all began and you, you believed in me and I didn't have anything yet. I, didn't, I did not have any references, just a passion for photography and the curiosity and he, he, he started to cry. He saw the book and he was crying and I was crying as well at that moment because I was like, oh my God, you know, it's really, he said, thank you for doing what you're doing. And I said, no, no, thank you for opening that door because it's really, that triggered me so much. The and and why, why do you think he opened that door for you? I don't know. He didn't give an answer. He just said, well, I believed in you. I saw it in your eyes that you were like, you had the genuine purpose to get in. And there are thousands of people trying to get in every year. And it's really impossible. I, I'm the only Belgian that went inside. So, it, you know. <laughs> so I had a story Can to tell. Can we get, get a, a, a little bit of an applause for, <laughs> for taking that step? No, but it's true. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 have, you're, you have to take the risk, right? It's also for you. And also for you, you're taking the risks yeah. to meet people, go into a conversation about things that, well, maybe they don't want to talk about, choosing images that people maybe don't want to see, going to places that people don't want you to see, and then have an effect. And I know there's somebody in the audience that uh, was really affected by this photo. I'm going to Cornelia over there, who is an architect. From Foundation We Are, organizing a lot of things here. Big round of applause for Cornelia. <laughs> you, you saw these images, you were a young architect, and then what happened? Well, I don't know if it was this specific picture of this building, but when I was graduating in architecture, I saw this and I thought, well, this is probably the types of buildings we will have to come up with to, to live together on this planet in the coming 100, 200, 300 years. And if you think of typologies of buildings like monasteries, universities, um, churches, we, we invented them to serve certain purposes of things that were important for us, to protect things that were important to us. And it seems like this would just be one of these. In a very cultural sense, I think. I think it says more about the culture of who we are as humans than if we will actually manage to save anything. Can we see more photos of, of these series? I think we have some more, no? Is this the inside? What are we looking at? This is my personal favorite. Oh, this is your perfect. So, okay. um, once that door gets open, it's a tunnel of 130 meters deep inside the permafrost in the mountain, you know, they dug it in. Um, and then you come in three rooms and the rooms are like, sized uh, from that pillar to that pillar and really from this wall to that wall with kind of the same height. So that's that's the size of the room. There are three rooms. Capacity is like 4.5 million seed crops, different varieties of, uh, and now we're at 1.2 and so on million. And nobody knows how many crop seeds there are. It's like, you know, in the deep sea, it's the best example. We discover daily new animals. So we don't, we still don't know. But we do know that this is now the uh, how do you say that, the, the most complete collection of f food variety crops uh, worldwide. And so this is the third room, the second room in 2014, they were already preparing it. The first one was already full. You can see the, the photos on my website. And this is the third one. And I, I always give a title to my photo. Uh, so this is Into Eternity. We don't know whether it will ever be used. And it's really built for the eternity. But the irony is, and that's for me also part of this story, I think it was 2016 that there was already a leak. So this construction with the tunnel and everything was built to um, preserve. Yeah, preserve for hundreds of years, for generations and gener generations to come. But already there was a leak, no seats were harmed, they're also sealed in boxes, deposit principle and so on. But the tunnel, the axis, is slightly, it has a, an angle. And I talked to the people who have a key, you know, and they said, well, you, you could just slide down all the way all 130 meter deep. So now they enforced everything. But how ironic, the thing was built and permafrost is melting so fast. Uh, so this is a story that I also bring out there when I give a lecture about this, you know. Um, it, it's it's really, the irony is, is obvious, I mean. <laughs> So the, so the white is, what is it, yeah. rock or is it ice? It is ice, ice crystals on, on concrete. And, 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 on and, concrete. and, and the, how do you call it, uh, I think it's lime, is it limestone? Stone? Okay. Yeah. So they enforced it and then it, it's minus 18. So everything is like, you see ice crystals everywhere inside. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's 
pretty cold. But yeah, now I didn't select this photo, but again on my website you can see it. The one room that is full now, it has already uh, like uh, two cooling instru um, uh, yeah, instruments, coolers. Huh? So I was like, why do we have to cool? Yeah. It's a North Pole, we're 130 meters deep in the permafrost and we have to cool it down. Yes, cor correct he said. It's warming up four to six times faster in the Arctic region. And okay. so without this, we have only minus 10. And by consensus, international scientific research and so on, uh, uh, crop pre preservation and preservation should be uh, at minus 18. So we have to cool it even more down, eight degrees. So that was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, it's these stories on my drive, you know. Yep. So I'm, I'm so fascinated by it and, and also curious. It starts with curiosity, of course, and I really want to bring this story out. I mean, people have to know about that. Yeah, but, well, okay, hold on. I know, curiosity. You have to organize <laughs> to get there. You have to have the, the quality to make this, this kind of, of picture. Also, apparently, you have to have people skills to actually get in. Yeah. Then you have to organize some kind of program, find people to sponsor it, uh, find an audience so you can have that lecture uh, and talk about some topic. And there's, I think, 100 topics in I, there. I think you have three values. Okay. Curiosity. Curiosity. I would say persistence. Persistence. Definitely. And networking as well. And, and the third would be respect. And respect. So a lot of respect. And respect, it, it has a lot. It's an ethical contribution. So I did actually a second master degree in global management to find out I would never <laughs> work in a company like KPMG, right? Um, anyway, uh, so I, I'm not m made for that kind of job. But I did it because I was like, okay, it's a really good addition to political science, global management, and it gave me a lot of skills. We had a lot of assessments, professional career assessments, and all of them, we did three, they took a, fu a full day, they all gave the, th the same results. Something for me personally, independent, with an ethical contribution in creative um, activity. So for me, it's always visual. Uh, since I was a child, it's, I had a camera, an old Zeiss Icon uh, from my father. Uh, this old uh, d uh, German camera, completely analog, and, and I was always fascinated by f the fact that you can capture a moment in time. Yeah. And, and, and the, the fact that you can bring so much in an image, you know. But so. indeed, a, a moment in time, yes. and then uh, it changes. You know, they, they, they build something and already it changed. Correct. So it's also, well, <laughs> I don't want to take the word the whole evening, but there is an other construction. It's called the Arctic World Archive. It's inside an, an abandoned coal mine. And I'm the first Belgian to contribute with my photography because the, the, the purpose is the same, but not preserving food crops, but knowledge, cultural heritage. And my idea, I did two projects, the Belgica, I'm assigned by the Belgian government, this is our research vessel, so I do the outreach for the Belgian research vessel, and the Pacific. We will come there uh, with the next photos. I do a lot Talking of work. Talking about collaboration also. A lot, yeah. a lot of work, eight years already in the Pacific region, which is very hard to get. It's a pain, but uh, you know, it's so important because that's the region where all this climate impact is really yeah. so visible and, and dramatic, really dramatic. People yeah. lose their land. Um, I will come to that with the, the next photos. But so I, I took my photos, put them on the reel, and they're inside a coal mine for future generations. Same story. Okay, to, yeah. to also continue yeah, you, you to share look the it story. Up. Arctic World Archive, it's really interesting. Arctic World? Yeah, it's Wereld Archive. Arctic World Archive. Okay, World thank you. Archive. Yeah. Thank you. So, you, a concrete example. Much more social, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can applaud, of course. <laughs> Let's go to the social part of climate change. I think that's really in your, your line of work, right? It's really about the people about, uh, who actually mm -hmm. are making a difference or not making a difference or holding back or doubting. Mm -hmm. What is a great example of a result that you worked in on? A result? Well, but uh, um, what, so one of the scenes in the film, yeah. that, uh, which I already exp uh, talked about, is, is, um, is, is the scene where Emily comes from America, yeah. her her job is taken from her, and the, 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 the instrument that she worked on for 10 years with, I don't know, uh, so many scientists in NASA, uh, there was, uh, I don't know how many millions of dollars was uh, used to, uh, to, to get all that research done, and now when it's almost finished, they cut off the head of this instrument, so when she comes to Holland and the the uh, scientists the, the the top scientists of Holland 
who are really like the fin fleur of the atmospheric uh, science, they say, well, this instrument, this is something that we need because normally, I have to explain, normally those instruments are uh, have the, the, the size of a, a, a container. So they're huge, they cost millions, a sea container, yes, thank you. And and, and this uh, instrument that Emily developed is as big, as, so you can pack it in as a backpack. So you, as a scientist, if you want to know, okay, what is the, uh, uh, how much CO2 is absorbed in the Amazon or how much is emitted next to Tata Steel, you can just go there with your instrument, put one or two instruments uh, around the spot that you are interested in, that you want to do research, and you can set it up in a day or something and take measurements. That was that is the goal. So when those scientists saw this instrument, they said, "Wow, fantastic!" And f for me, this scene was very important because th this was um, um, a direct evidence of how you can wreck things. Things can go uh, very much uh, <laughs> broken by policy uh, and, and and when people said oh trump it's going to be a disaster but you uh, but this was how disaster looks like in on one hand in slow motion but on the other hand it, 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 it was very fast because he got in and within a year uh, uh, her her job was cut and her job was not cut by trump her her job was cut by the management of nasa who was scared and so preemptively they th and, and those are not like uh, people who don't believe in climate change but still they did it so uh, and we in Holland <laughs> are uh, this is like the the night before right the PVV and FVD are yeah, in our government probably may, may I the ask next government because indeed you're talking about the United States all the time and you really made a choice to go there yeah over and over again to talk to Americans yeah why, why did you make that choice uh, I, 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 let, just let me finish. Okay, so, so okay. I, I wanted to to show the audience what a wrecking ball can do, uh, uh, and not by telling them, but to see the 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 the, 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 the communications between this American scientist and she's in the film. She says, "I hope you can take care of the, my instrument," like she's giving a baby. So uh, yeah, I, I thought that was. Uh, I hope. That that added something to uh, to uh, the imagination of what it means I if you choose people like that, and that's what I am afraid of with our next government. So why did I go to the United States? Because the United States sets the tone and uh, invests a lot of uh, uh, money for climate denying. So that's why for the first film I went to the United States, yep. and and for the second film. Yeah, like the same thing. Uh, I mean, the uh, climate science. If you are a climate scientist, you want to go to the United States because there is so much money. Uh, and then Trump came, and what happened? You know, there was like an exodus. They went everywhere. And in the film, you we, we witnessed this. Let your work speak for itself. Let's watch a clip from Farewell America. Vraag aan jullie wat dit met jullie doet als je dit zo ziet. Ik zie sommige mensen heel serieus kijken. Ik zie hier ook wel een glimlach. Wat, wat doet het met jou? Nou, ik vind het heel goed dat ze, dat ze gewoon doorgaat tot, tot het gaatje, zeg maar. En met, volgens mij ook wel met de hoop om dat instrument toch zijn werk te laten doen, maar dan op andere plekken. Maar het is natuurlijk schrij super schrijnend. Ja. Gideon, wat deed dat met jou toen je dat gesprek had? Ja, nee, dat was gewoon... Dat was, ja, aan de ene kant is het nachtmerrie, aan de andere kant... Uh, Sorry? English. Sorry. Oh, sorry. 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 Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm very sorry. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, when that happened, I was really saddened, but it was exactly what I was af afraid of. And uh, uh, in in the beginning, you said, you, "What makes you take a? Why do you start a project?" And I said, "Well, anger." But uh, of course, uh, curiosity is the same, and I want to understand the the world that I live in. So um, uh, I wanted to see what this uh, wrecking ball could do. And then I saw it happening, and uh, and life. Uh, I mean, you can think about oh well, this will happen, but the reality is always surprising, and uh, there are always surprises. So yeah. 
the, all the images that, that you create, whether it's a photo or whether it's, it's imagery around an article or whether it's a, a documentary in full, um, of course, it, it brings up conversations, right? You organize the, those conversations y yourself. Um, how, do you, how do you balance your work in making the images and then also going around selling the story? How do you balance that? And so many caps you have to wear, right? Yeah, that's correct. There's never enough time. <laughs> so I tried to, personally, I tried to combine it. So uh, last year I went around the world and I gave lectures in Hong Kong, two universities actually, Lingyan and the uh, University of Hong Kong. Um, while going through to the Pacific, Marshall Islands, Federal States of Micronesia, Hawaii, I have a strong network in Hawaii. Also with NOAA, that's, uh, you will know NOAA, so National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency of the US. And then on the way back, well, on the on the way to go, so I first stopped in, in Argentina, then I had a, the Belgian embassy, I do a lot with the embassies. So I, I try to combine it. So it, I, I really plan eight, nine months ahead and try to combine lectures with exhibitions with my work. Okay, great. Great comment. How do you do that, Gideon? Well, uh, yeah, uh, it, 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 I don't know. <laughs> you just survive and you try to sell as much films as you can and uh, it, it's very difficult because uh, I would love not to be the one that tries to, to sell all the films, but in the end, even if you have a producer, you have to do everything yourself and uh, to, uh, yeah, it's very hard. It's a, a lot of competition and there is always a shortage of money and there is too much to do. So it's yeah. a lot of work. Well, we're, we're talking about uh, collaborations here yeah. as well. Uh, which kinds of, of, of collaborations are really important for you? For, for me? For, for making mo films or what? For doing what you do, for making the, the movies, for getting this conversation going. <coughs> oh, uh... Uh, the, the f so the first the inner circle is that uh, yeah. uh, I, I'm not a photographer. So uh, the, the nice thing about your job uh, and uh, probably also very difficult side of your job is that you're alone, but you know your yeah. crew very well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who, who, who are your? Who is your crew? So I, I, I have like an, uh, 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 like camera people and editors uh, that I and sound uh, engineers that I work with a lot for many years. So uh, and they grow to be like your family and you can have discussions with them. So that's very nice. So you, you, you're not so alone that, that that helps. But it's also difficult because you, you when you go somewhere, you're always like intruding with like a tribe. Whereas if you are uh, only with your camera, uh, sometimes I dream about that because it, to move on your own, it's much yeah, much more convenient. And Less and filming overwhelming. Filming is a drag. <laughs> it's yeah. a, you are just annoying. <laughs> but, um, uh, 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 and it's very important that there are people, uh, you just need a few people that really understand what you're doing and that give you trust. Uh, like the, the person that you encountered. Yes. I also were, was lucky that I encountered some people in my career that really gave me an opportunity and believed in the project while I was still junior. So uh, you, you really ne always need people um, that believe in you. And I, I'm, it's very hard to find those people, but that's the challenge. And the collaboration with scientists, for, for example. I mean, when, when <coughs> I'm preparing for, for programs, uh, and there it's, it's really complex matter yeah. at stake, and also to have conversations uh, about. How do you work together with scientists? Uh, yeah, through the, this, this last film, I, I, I got a really big network of... Uh, climate scientists and uh, yeah, so it's, it's like you said, so scientists, they work their ass off trying to get grants because also for them, in order to do your, your work, you need money. So they, like filmmakers, they have to run after money all the time, which is uh, wearing them out, like it, it's wearing everybody out. So, uh, and then of course, there's this thing that we, that you talked about with a person about the difficulty of trying to find the the same the, the vocabulary to find so the right words so you can be sure that you talk about the same thing <laughs> so we, uh, that's a challenge also with scientists and i think for us people in the creative industry it, that is one of our assignments to try to take this science which is non which is completely uh, uh, not understandable or relatable for the uh, audience at large to make it relatable and to 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 
because uh, I mean, science for science, it's nice, but it's it, it, I mean, we should all know what reality looks like. And yeah, and, it's, and, and it's also public. And when you're a scientist yeah. and you work on the front of of, of science, then yeah. it it needs translation and it needs people like us. Fele, I see you nodding because I think it's also happening at the co at the correspondent, right? That you, you have all this this research going on, and you have this the journalists, the authors, mm -hmm. investigating and coming to a, to a story, and then you work together with the visual artists. How do you um, get to a, a, a collective understanding of the matter? Um, yeah, I was more nodding because I was thinking of something. <laughs> something else because yeah, I think can bring maybe it in. can just go in that direction. Yeah, yeah br um, bring it in. Um, because I think like the storytelling part should be really part of the studies of, of at universities okay. more. I think that's that's yeah. um, and, and, and and how can we push that with forward. this program <laughs> uh, and maybe also yeah just uh, finding uh, maybe from the beginning already connecting with artists and um, yeah, more more collaborations between different disciplines. I think that's really important, and I think, uh, like you also said, so many people are struggling to to find a shared language. Um, so I was more <laughs> thinking about that, but um, I think at the correspondent, um, I have the luxury that we have the the journalists that do most of the research. Um, so yeah, sorry, I forgot about the, the specific question. You had yeah, yeah I, I was just imagining that you indeed, at the course management, it's happening, right? You have these different layers, and in the end, there is an article that is quite readable, mm -hmm. with very uh, uh, essential information, um, uh, combined with images, so that also people who have maybe uh, more affection with, with images also understand. Mm -hmm. um, so something magical is, is happening there. And, and I was just wondering how you do that. How do you come to a gathered, a collective understanding of the matter at stake? Um, yeah, just by Within only two weeks. Talking about it a lot with, with all the people that are involved in, in the creating the story um, and also be critical on, um, on what we are telling and, and how people um, interpreted it and um, yeah, uh, just talking a lot about it, I think, um, from different uh, angles and perspectives. Yeah, great. What, 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 uh, there's what, what I've encountered many times is that um, uh, with, especially with climate scientists, uh, imagine you're a climate scientist. Yes. If you're a, a climate scientist, I mean, uh, uh, for already like uh, 30 years, for scientists, if you're working in the field of climate science, there's no doubt about cli about all of this. They know. Oh, for 30 years, like, like so. No, people are doubting them now. Some of them. Yeah, sometimes. No, no, actually, yeah. 40 years now, right? Yeah. Uh, Hansen was uh, in the, in the end of the 70s in Congress in America. Yeah. So uh, that, that's already four decades. Yep. So, uh, and I've encountered many uh, climate scientists who said, okay, w maybe we should do some more introspection because w maybe we yep. are, are also at fault because we know <coughs> all of this and, 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 and we already know enough, like already 20, 30 years ago, maybe we didn't tell the story right. Uh, and that made some, some scientists really depressive because uh, they they know better than all of us uh, what it, uh what what that really means? What all the, those data really mean? Uh, and um, uh, yeah, that, that for, f for for them uh, that's that's also so harsh. I, it, it's not uh, to, how, to, how to put the blame on them, but it's just no, of course not. Uh, 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 they took it upon themselves. So as you as you already are working on this, how do you think we can help them? How can we contribute to their work? Yeah, I think every human being has the obligation to try to understand the life, the world that he's living in, and so asking questions and and and, and, and uh, things like that. And have and more conversations as as you do at the correspondent with them. Yeah. And you? Being inquisitive. That's being yeah. inquisitive. Yeah. What yeah, does really that mean to be inquisitive? Like uh, curiosity. Out of curiosity, you want to investigate. You want to understand. So. 
to put places and who, in their context. Uh, who should be the, more in inquisitive? I'm not going to say who should be, but I think everyone yeah, should be. Yeah, everyone should. Yeah. It's a moral obligation, yeah. I agree. Yeah. It's a moral obligation yeah. to be inquisitive. We are humans on this planet, yeah. Yeah. Awareness? That's uh, what you were saying also. So people should become more aware indeed of the fact that we are yeah. part of nature, that we are That's hardly uh, uh, yeah. in touch with what we are, who we do, what we feel, how we mm -hmm. think. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. L let me go to Meryl because she is my uh, fellow uh, mission uh, <laughs> partner in uh, Bursting Bubbles. Uh, how do you want to reply to this? Yeah. So I, um, I always worked in advertising. And at one point I thought, okay, we can do one thing very well, and that is uh, telling stories and convincing people to change their behavior, for example, buy something. And then I thought, okay, this skill, nice, but can you put, use it to uh, talk about climate change? And I think here as well, like talking about these scientists that, so I started a scientific study and I work a lot with scientists. Um, and they often cannot tell, tell the story, it's not their skill, and I think that's okay, because if you look at the commercial industry, there's a whole new industry built to tell the story, to translate from buy this to make an interesting campaign out of it. And I think actually looking at science, we should not put this pressure on the scientists, but we have to create this new industry that does it for them. And I think you're already in this industry of doing it. You're that, that's, it's a very nice bridge to how we can end, end this evening, to... to Imagine the future. Imagine the future of visual representation regarding climate change, right? When I'm looking here at, at the experts, in five years, three to five years, how do you imagine your field changed? I never thought of that. Um, probably AI, right? AI? <laughs> um, there it is. It's difficult for me because I'm, as a documentary photographer, I don't like AI, you know? Um, I, I want to the camera as a witness, not the computer. I mean, not the generated whatever. So it's a difficult question. Never thought of it actually. Well, think of it a little <laughs> bit more. Gideon, the future of your field of expertise. How did it change in three to five years? Um, well, I, I think for, uh, storytelling will always be there in some kind of form, and uh, I don't know what it will be. I hope it will be exciting and I hope more people uh, can uh, become storytellers and today everybody with a phone or uh, can become a storyteller, make a podcast or make a film. W w w when, when you asked us th in the beginning the question I thought was brilliant that to imagine climate change, we all had kind of very, uh, and I, I did two uh, negative visions of the future. So if, if I think about the future, and if I think about climate change, one of the things that I start to learn more and more is that it's also a problem of uncare. So if we care more about ourselves, about the, the person next to us, about our families, about the world, about nature, then things can change. And, and, and I think if we care more about our scientists, we can help them. Because if you're a scientist and you are studying climate change, you don't have to be a, a presenter of a, an evening. You are a, si a climate scientist. So uh, I, I think it starts, uh, I think we have to think more about care and what it really means and what it does to us and, and the culture that we live in, that it celebrates the opposite, like uncare and 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 more focuses on the individual and say, well, you can do anything, you can, you can become anything and there are no limits. While well, we know that that's the problem, that the earth is finite and there are limits and that we should care. You're talking about uh, um, a culture change yes. for climate change. Yeah. Okay. You, Fiala? Um, I think, I, I hope that like when you're asking this same question from like the uh, beginning of this uh, talk, that we have an other image in our head when we think about climate change and I hope that it can be a story that is more about or more focusing on imagining a future um, that goes into the good direction or more like the problem solving and um, how we can be part of that positive change instead of only um, the negative parts of it. So I mean we should still keep on going with telling these stories and, and, and uh, make people aware of the urgency of this but I hope 
parallel to that, there can also be a story that is more focused on imagining futures. Um, I, I think especially for designers and artists, this is um, something we can do because we can work with things that are still that are, are, are not there or, um, or are uncertain. And yeah. It's nice that you are, you are actually helping me to make almost the end, create the end of this evening. I had an assistant in the audience that didn't really do the job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't look at you. Oh, I thought you were bold enough to just yell at me. But um, it, it's nice. What, what I wanted to do with you, so we, we closed our eyes in the beginning. And we were just really honest, very personal, shared these words of what climate change actually, what kind of image it brings up, right? Could you, could you please close your eyes again for me? We've been talking about climate, cha climate change and how we created this image and how that people with certain expertise, certain talents are creating images around this topic that is so complex. And now we imagine the future. In three to five years, something changed. We were talking about a different culture to support climate change, to contribute to. Fierle was talking about taking a role in there, bringing it closer to us. What if indeed in three to five years we, we, we brought climate change a little bit closer to us? And we found our role in there. Now, what do you see? Climate change in three to five years, and you found your role. I'd like to ask you again, what do you see? Just come up with three words, can be small sentences, and let's do a, a last round. Climate change, three to five years forward. You found your role. You took, you took a look around. What do you see? A neighborhood with slikken and schorren. <laughs> a neighborhood with slikken and schorren. Thank you. I'm a bit blank, so please give me some time. Okay, I'll come back to you. Um, something about making shelters for animals. Making shelters for animals. Feel it? Mm, yeah, uh, more shared knowledge, I think, or like a, oh sorry, same direction. Shared knowledge. Here? Having conversations. Oh. Conversations? <laughs> Um, gardening with children in uh, growing food. Thank you. Consciousness, tissue, and mushrooms. Thank you. Um, compact green cities and communities. Thank you. Fighting against climate change is fun. Fighting against clim climate change is fun. And just a human standing in nature. Just a human standing in nature. Um, I actually keep seeing the ice tunnel um, and some positive protection. Thank you. Um, being more humble with our lifestyle. Thank you. Um, refugees loss and a new standard of life. New standard of life. Uh, people in a conversation really listening to each other. People in a conversation really listening to each other. I will probably still be making exhibitions, but um, more and more conscious and with more and more people uh, involving artists and scientists even more than I already do, because it's always, it can always be um, better. Deepener, deeper, yep. Um, I see friends and family working together, helping each other out, caring for each other. 
Thank you. Different kind of kinds of conversations with people I see my daily on a daily basis. Yeah, more interpreted than yeah. Okay. I, I guess just small steps in the right direction and trying to convince other people to do the same. Thank you. Let's go here. I see people taking care of each other. People taking care of each other. And I have someone here standing. Maybe three words from Cornelia. Um, green, pink, and my hands in the mud. Green, pink, and hands in the mud. I would say personal consciousness. Personal consciousness, thank you. Gideon, you, you thought of it very long. Oh, uh, well, I hope for a more caring world with collaboration. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And last but not least, Christian. I hope for uh, a system change, rethinking all layers of society, I think. System change. You can open your eyes. Thank you for sharing that. Let me also share my dream more people of different backgrounds in these audiences to have these conversations with. So I want to thank you for coming. I'm looking at, at the time. Uh, we have seven minutes left to also go to the bar. Um, I want to also give you the chance to ask some questions already here. Are, are there people who have really burning questions or topics that we didn't address yet? Oh, Gideon, what's, what's your next movie? What are you working on? Yeah, so I, I, I'm um, I'm very much intrigued into the uh, psychological side of uh, climate change and, and, and what is happening within people, uh, um, and uh, also the cultural side about the culture of uncare, uh, and and. Um, so that that's one of my focus uh, now, and 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 the other thing is like really the opposite. It's like that is has to do with the instrument that I'm doing, uh, and with the NGO that, that that we are trying to build and and and, and trying to measure um, the atmosphere, uh, which is uh, all about going to strange places with those instruments and take measurements and try to understand what the data means and try to find the stories behind that data because if it says 2% more CO2 or a half percent less, it doesn't mean anything to anyone. So try to uh, translate data into stories. So, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, th if that would be the end goal, that would be fantastic. That would be my, uh, yeah, that's my like my wet dream that everybody would have that instrument and take measurements and f and, uh, and that everybody is a scientist and 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 knows what is going up uh, above their heads everywhere around the world. Yeah. <laughs> how how we, can we support that dream? We are not there yet. No. How, how can we support that dream? Um, uh, w w uh, well, I, I will send uh, the. the Yes, the name of the NGO, and then you can get a newsletter of what's going on. <laughs> Ingrid was already mentioning a crowdfunder. She's like, we have to also pay for it. <laughs> yes, yeah, question. Yeah, I was wondering um, what the role of government should be in all this, if there is any role. I had a whole morning talking with people from the government about exactly this. I'm very curious what, you, what your answer would be. <laughs> and then everyone looks at me. Oh, is it for me? <laughs> Yes, yeah, Christian. Because I said yeah. system change. <laughs> um, well, I would say the government should. Um, uh, what shall I say? <laughs> I'm so disappointed in that. So, um, I believe that um, they should uh, provide more legal framework so that. Uh, uh, well, maybe it's a bit upsetting, but enterprises they will have the money to to bring the change. So, I just hope it will happen. And by system change, I mean that it, 
it doesn't mean like we have to overthrow capitalism or something, but we do have to overthrow the greed. Uh, but um, but I mean like we have to rethink syst on, on a systematic base everything. So, yeah. But, um, when we talk about government, the question is, uh, what is government nowadays? You know, who is in government? What kind of people? What, are you, what is governing us, you know? Because I, I wonder whether government can do quite a lot also. So that's also really kind of complex. It is. It's yeah. very. Uh, you're yeah, it's also very simple. I mean, the the yeah. first thing that the government should do is take care, because that's why the gov the, the government sh sh and, and the government should uh, be honest, yeah. right? The politicians mm. should be honest and uh, uh, should be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You you also have a question, right? I have, but I'm not sure how to ask. So I, I, yeah. So I was triggered by the fact that you were mentioning in the beginning that you want to be neutral in the things you're doing right and you mentioned as your dream that you want to have a systemic change so I'm more curious how you see that being neutral while making the system changing. Well I don't have a solution to offer so I just hope that we mm -hmm. can all tr contribute and you as well as an audience you're a fantastic audience how you know let's try to really bring it out there uh, also to the government spheres um, uh, you know <laughs> and to the voters as well, yeah. Uh, I want to um, propose and invite everybody to continue this story uh, at the bar with a, with a drink, um, but not before we give a very warm applause for Foundation We Are for hosting this. My apology for not always being so uh, really, really clear and sharp on my, on my questions. I'm, I'm very sorry, but please come. Thursday, June 20, to uh, the final uh, uh, meetup here. How do we embody climate change? Thank you for your patience and uh, we'll see you next time.